morning, New Covenant. Good morning. Isn't it wonderful that everywhere we look, Hallelujah. that love is all around? Yes. And if you can't find it nowhere else, you're going to find it here at the Cub. Won't you join me in an attitude of prayer? Eternal and everlasting God, we come at this time not to find fault, grumble, or complain, but we come at this time in this place to say thank you. Thank you. Lord, we thank you that things are as well as they are. Lord, we thank you for our pastor, our rabbi, our shepherd, the teacher, the one that's teaching us how to live, how to make our finances healed, and how we can be whole and healed in you. Lord, what people come here today, some looking for one thing and some for another, but you know what we stand in the need of, and we ask you to meet us at that need. Us here in the temple, those in digital land, May they be blessed, touched, anointed, and healed. Now, God, bless this service. Bless the word as it goes forth. Keep us and we'll be kept. Heal us and we'll be healed. Save us, hallelujah, and we'll be saved. In the matchless name of God, I pray, amen. We're singing about love on today. Somebody lift your hands right where you are. Put that compliment on your lips. Speak well of your Father in the place on today. God, we love you. We honor you. We bless you. We thank you for this place, this space, and this moment. We love you, Jesus, because you first loved us. Anybody love him in the house on today? Well, if you love him, take a moment and express that sentiment of your heart in the place. Hallelujah to your name, oh God. Simple song of worship that we like to sing every time. Every time I read about you, every time I read, every time I read about you, every time I hear your name, I start to smile. Every time, every time the wind starts blowing, and the wind starts blowing, every time the wind starts blowing, and I feel your anointing. Every time I feel your anointing. I start to smile. So right here, we lift our hands and let me take the time. Let me take the time to say I love you. Let me take the time. Let me take the time to say If you love him, I love you, Lord.
those hands for a moment and say, I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. Can we just love on him for another moment? I love you, Jesus. And not only that, but I worship. I worship I Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you. I just want to hear the voices. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I worship and I worship and adore just you. Just want to tell you. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you more than anything. We've got to move, but let me hear the people of God say, I love you. I worship and I worship and I just want to tell you, Lord, I love you. One last time, I'm in love with Jesus. Why don't you take a moment and just express to God why you love him so much. The things he's done for you, the ways he's made for you, the provisions he's provided. Just go ahead, open up your mouth. You put your hands together, now move your mouth. Tell God what it is that you bless him for, what it is that you love him for, how you honor him. God, thank you for doing it for us again. It's another week you've blessed us. It's another week that you've kept us. God, we're mindful of your mercy and we're grateful for your grace. We recognize that it could have gone another way, a different way, a worse way, but you blessed us and you kept us. And God, we simply say thank you today. We're in love with Jesus. And there's nothing you can do to fall out of the place where God won't love you back. We forsake him, we turn our back on him, but God just keeps on loving us over and over again. We thank God. God's enduring and everlasting love. Listen, we love God and we love you and we're glad that you made your way to worship today. Can we pause and see the hand of anybody that's a guest? You're not a member of New Covenant, but you're a guest here. You're visiting with us. I see you. Thank you. We so appreciate your presence. Keep your hands lifted. We've got some amazing ushers that are going to come by and give you a card. Simply ask that you would fill that out and turn it in during the offering period. Not going to bug you or harass you, but just want to say hey to you throughout the course of the week. Check in on you and see if there's anything that you need that we can service you with. Members, we see our guests who've raised their hand, and you see your other partners out of here today. Come on, let's greet somebody. Let's show the love of Jesus to our brothers and sisters. A hug. High five, fist bump, elbow bump, whatever you're comfortable with. Get out your row. Get out your seat. Say hey to somebody. I see fellowship in the house. I see Salem in the house. We're glad you're here. Welcome to the club. We're happy today. So happy you came by the club.
It's our prayer. It's our prayer. That God would blow your mind. Do some amazing things. Meet you right where you are. Come on, one more time. We're so glad. We're so happy. We're so excited you're here. Let's put our hands together and celebrate all of our guests that are with us in this place today.
I don't know about y'all, but I believe her. Yes. Is he your everything today, church? Give your neighbor a high five and say, he's my everything. Everything. Money in the bank, healing in my pocket, oh, healing in my body. Hallelujah, he's my everything. Let's show Yolanda some love, y'all. Do me a favor, put those V's in the air if your name is Victory.
say it again. I know. Matthew chapter 19 is where we'll hang out today as we celebrate the victory that we have. Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 22. I'll be reading from the Message Bible today. Matthew chapter 19, we celebrate the music ministry of the Cove. Can we put our hands together? Y'all could do better than that. Can we celebrate the gifts? that lead us week after week. We thank you for what you give. And Ms. Diane Crouch and family know that we're praying for you and the loss of her sister. We're praying for that Crouch family as they navigate this space called grief. And again, your name wasn't on the list today, but it could be this evening. And so the same love, care, compassion, and concern you want to receive, let's make sure we shower the Crouch family with all of that as they navigate this space. Matthew chapter 19 verses 16 to 22, the message Bible reads like this. Another day, <clears throat> a man stopped Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Jesus said, Why do you question me about what's good? God is the only one who is good. If you want to enter the life of God, just do what he tells you. The man asked, What in particular? Jesus said, Don't murder don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as you do yourself. The young man said, I've done all that. What's left? If you want to give it all you got, Jesus replied, go sell your possessions. Give everything to the poor, and all your wealth will then be in heaven. Then come follow me. That was the last thing the young man expected to hear. And so, crestfallen, he walked away. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and couldn't bear to let go. That was the last thing the young man expected to hear. And so, crestfallen, he walked away. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and he couldn't bear to let go. For our time of sharing this morning, allow me to hang this homiletical headline above the text. Headline reading, Before I Let Go. Come on, y'all can act like you've heard this before. Turn it up, DJ. I just wanted to see who the secular saints are in the house today. Some of y'all trying to act all saved and sedity. You was backing that thing up yesterday. Got that Bengay on your knees right now and want to sit here like, I've never heard that song before. Dismissed as a mere afterthought and relegated to the B-side of the 1981 Live in New Orleans album as a simple filler. And yet, 43 years later, Before I Let Go is still standing as a staple within the African-American community. From sizzling summer cookouts to the joyous chaos of weddings, from fun-filled family reunions to the somber setting of repasts, the reality of the matter is that a party just ain't a party until the rhythmic groove of that intro drops, rapturing the crowd 
into a place of euphoric effervescence. But despite this song's transformative power to foster a feel-good atmosphere, the backstory of this five-minute, six-second track is that it was birthed from the burden of a breakup. In an interview with Essence magazine, Frankie Beverly shared that it was while he was involved in one relationship that he earnestly desired to be in another. But because the woman that he desired had died, he now found himself in a peculiar predicament. Frankie admitted that life got hard because he wasn't with the woman he wanted to be with and couldn't stay with the one he was with. And as a result of this pain, his pain now penned these lyrics as he lamented over letting go. While we find Frankie lamenting letting go of his woman in this song, as we tune into the times of our text, we likewise find a leader lamenting letting go of his wealth in Scripture. As we penetrate the periphery of this particular pericope, we're introduced to a rich young ruler approaching Jesus, seeking strategy to now secure his soul's salvation. An attentive read of this text reveals that the conversation commences with a man who's secure and serene, but concludes with a man who's shocked and sorrowful. As he'd entered now this conversation to get, but exits when he finds out that he'd have to give. And it's within this context, Keisha, that I, I see the parallel between Frankie, the ruler, you, and yes, even me. Because the rather forbidding and foreboding analysis of the human condition is that all of us are holding on too tight to something that we seemingly can't bear to let go. And before some of you tiptoe away from this text and this teaching, because you figure that this text is tailored to teach about power and prosperity, neither of which do you have, let me caution you not to tune me out too fast and exonerate yourself from this preaching presentation. Because the truth of the matter is that the inability to let go transcends the material and the monetary. Y'all missed it, so let me see if I can come this way. For some of us, it's not the things that we hold in our hand, but rather the things we hold in our head and on our heart that we seemingly can't find the strength to let go. Somebody's sitting in this place and you holding on real tight, Aunt Claude, about some, some things in your life, your pride and your arrogance and your self-righteous piety, your cultural constructs that you've camouflaged as Christianity. I'm talking about your anger. That, that, that self-doubt that's sitting on the inside of you, your control issues, your expectations. Maybe it's your failures your mistakes and your missteps, maybe even the plans that you've designed and devised for your life. The reality is that regardless of how holy and heaven-bound you are, because all of us are holding on to something, my challenge to all of us today is that we listen, not just with our ears, but more importantly, with our hearts. As we engage this, this, this introspective inquisition of what we're holding on to so tightly that we just can't say to let go. I'm simply seeking to suggest that this text is tailored to speak to all of us, not just some of us. And it does so by first speaking to our desires. As a result of the familiarity of this text, Minister Whitehead, our focus is often fixated on the ruler's finances at the expense of obscuring the depths of this story, causing us to miss this man's main motivation. Yes, his wealth is undeniable. His position, his power, and prosperity are all readily apparent, Betty. Yet, as I read the text, I was drawn not to the glitter of his possessions, but to the flicker of something more profound within him. What captured my attention is the fact that in spite of all he has, he still has the presence of mind, the self-awareness, 
the emotional intelligence and the spiritual alertness to recognize a longing that transcends the material. He had the stuff, but he recognized he was missing a savior. He had the things, but he recognized that there was something on the inside of him that was yet still absent. And now driven by disquiet, he comes to Jesus wanting to know, what must I do to be saved? And no, notice now, here in the text, Dr. Kim, that he comes uh, at the right time, asking the right person, asking the right question, and he received the right answer. Yet the text tells us, the Bible says, that he still struggles with making the right decision. He came to the right person at the right time, asking the right question in the right setting. He got the right answers, but yet he's still struggling with making the right answer. And if you're wondering why, I'd like to suggest that as I exe exegeted this text, that it's because the heart of his problem was actually a problem with his heart. Y'all looking at me like I'm making this up, but it's right here in the text. Verse 18 says here in the text, the man asked, what in particular? Jesus said, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, honor your mama and your daddy, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. In the text, this rich young ruler, Miss Nash, had mastered religion, but I discovered that he misunderstood relationship. He had it in his head but he was missing it in his heart. New Covenant, he knew the law, but he failed to get in connection with the Lord. And I'ma hang out here just long enough with the hope of helping somebody that's in this place or even tuned in in the digital space who needs to let go of a works-based mentality concerning your salvation. You need to know that access to eternal life Ain't about checking off some boxes, making sure you're part of the moral majority. It's not about completing a checklist of activities. It's not about community service hours. It has nothing to do with our outward demonstration, our vocal presentation, but it has everything to do with our inward transformation. I'm just trying to help some of y'all that are holier than Jesus. Jesus Jr.'s walking around here with halos hovering above your head and wings beneath your garments and crosses around your chest bigger than the one that Christ was crucified on carrying Bibles bigger than that Bible that was sitting on your grandmama's coffee table. I'm trying to help some of you holy, saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, doing everything in the church folk to recognize that it ain't about what you do. Your work won't grant you access to heaven. And Christ is calling for us to make a commitment to follow him by faith, to invite him into our hearts and to establish a personal relationship with him where we desire to know him, ah, not just casually, but intimately. And the wonderful thing about today is that if you're in this place or even in the digital space and you're wrestling with the same question that this man presents to Jesus, the good news is that you're in the right place at the right time, asking the right questions around the right people who'd love and would desire to help you to make the right decision. All I'm trying to tell you is that you don't have to keep putting off the process of attaining of attaining access to eternal life. But here's the question that you'll be forced to reckon with. Here's the question that you'll have to provide an answer to. What is it that you're holding on to so tightly that you can't afford to let go of? What is it that's hindering you from committing your life to Christ? What is it that God is saying, give it to me? And you keep saying, I got to keep it for myself. Is it some sin? Is it some past mistake? Is it some regret? Is it some trauma? Is it some fear? Is it some hurt? Is it the opinions of others? What is it that you're holding on to so tightly 
that you just can't see to let go. But maybe you're today like frankly, and you're saying, Stephen, I just want to make sure I'm right, man, before I let go. Stephen, before I, I get rid of my old life and accept this new life in Christ, I've got to clean up some of the stuff that I've messed up. Well, let me liberate your thinking from that line of lies that you keep telling yourself. Because the reality of the matter is that when we connect with Christ, all things are made new. The past is wiped away. The slate is wiped clean. Your record has been washed away. It's been expunged. There's no background there. And grace now abides in your life. And just in case you think you've done some stuff worse than other people's stuff, I've come to tell you that you're sitting on the road with some heretics and some hellions today. There's somebody that's got more dirt than you got and could ever get that's sitting in here today, but they're under the grace of God, the power of God, and the joy of God is living in their life because they turn their life over to Jesus and he's working it out. Here it is. This man says, ah, I want to get to heaven. What must I do to be saved? And all you need to do today is move to a place of having a desire to move forward in your walk of faith. That, that's all it takes. No checklists, no to-do lists. All you got to do is have a desire to invite Christ into your life. Ain't got to roll on the floor. Ain't got to foam at the mouth. Ain't got to buck dance and run around. All you've got to do is have a desire to invite Christ into your life. If we're going to let go of things we've been holding on to so tightly, not only will we have to deal with our desire, but second, the text tells us that we'll have to deal with our deception. Now, I know that I'm talking to some people that are literally card-carrying members of the moral majority. I understand that you're in this place today. I understand that you, like this rich young ruler, can testify that your life has been lived in a way where you've checked off all the boxes of all the things that Jesus commanded him to do here in the text to find relationship and gain access to salvation. I know you get it right all the time. I know you ain't got no issues in your life. I know you're like Job. You're upright and you're perfect. You eschew evil. You, you step away from the presence of evil. You've got it all together. I get it. I understand. And because I know I got some messy people in here that are trying to figure out who I'm talking about, let me help you. I ain't talking about nobody. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. And what I'm talking about are these scorecards and checklists that some of us are holding on to that we need to let go of. We strut around here all high and mighty and holy, deceiving ourselves into believing that all of this that we do is currying extra favor with God. Let me help you, Jesus Jr. In spite of how good you see yourself as, and in spite of how good you want us to think you really are, the reality of the matter is that God knows who all of us is up in here. You can paint it up, fix it up, dress it up, come in here and act like you Heathcliff and Claire Huxtable and everything is just perfect in your life when the reality of the matter is that it's a nightmare on Elm Street when we get back to your house. It doesn't matter what you present to us. God knows all about us. God sees us for who and what we are. And because some of us haven't put our works and deeds into proper perspective, let me remind you that we don't work to get saved. No, the reality is that we work because we are saved. Ah, uh, let me hit a rewind, go back. We don't work to get saved. No, we work because we are saved saved. Salvation has nothing to do with what we've done, but everything to do with what was done. Oh, y'all missing it. It's flying right over your head. Ah, uh, Adrian, let me see if the hymnologist can help me here. At last, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Savior die? Would he devote a sacred head for sinners such as I was in for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon that tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. But drops of grief 
can never repay. I wish y'all knew some hymns in here. The debt of love, I owe here, Lord, I give myself to thee. Tis all that I can do at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. And the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there on that cross by faith. I received my sight and now I'm happy all the days. Oh, maybe that didn't move you. Maybe that didn't speak to your spirit. Maybe that didn't help you to recognize that it ain't about what you do, but what was done on a hill far away. Stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain in that old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine. A wondrous beauty I see. For twas on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. The old rugged cross, I will ever be true. Its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish that old rugged cross. Until my trophies at last I lay down, I'll cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. I'm just trying to help us so that deception doesn't derail us from our desired destination. It ain't about what you do, it's about what Christ did. Some of us need to let go of this deception that we've been holding on to so tightly. I got to go, I'm over my time, but if we're going to let go of things we've been holding on to so tightly, not only will we have to deal with desire, not, not only will we have to deal with deception, but third and finally, we've got to deal with decision. Again, as we look at this text, we find this rich young ruler engaging with the right person at the right time, asking the right questions, but still struggling to make the right decision. Within this cultural context, Jesus' request for this young man to liquidate his assets would have been received as radical and reckless. Yes, he had riches and resources, but I believe this man probably also had some responsibilities. He'd secured the bag, but he probably also had some bills. And as I read the text regarding his response to Jesus' request, I noticed, Tony, a nuance. It, it's right here in the text. You may have missed it because you read it too quickly. But when I read the text in verse number 22, I see a nuance. Then Callahan, it says, that was the last thing the young man expected to hear. And so crestfallen, he walked away and was holding on tight to a lot of things, and he couldn't bear to let go. That was the last thing the young man expected to hear. And so crestfallen, he walked away. I'm going to say it one more time because maybe you'll get it then. That was the last thing that young man expected to hear. And so he walked away crestfallen. He was holding on too tight to a lot of things, and couldn't bear to let go. Maybe you're missing the point that I'm trying to drive home because you lack clarity concerning crestfallen. You, you didn't bring your dictionary nor your thesaurus today. Y'all ought to know what you ought to do when you come to the cove. No problem, I got you. Crestfallen simply means that he was downcast, despondent, disconsolate, dispirited, dejected, desolate. This man was depressed. Come here, New Covenant, walk with me. I'm going somewhere. Jesus makes a request regarding his resources, and his response is depression. Jesus says, give me your stuff. And this man now finds himself battling with depression. You can relate. It's how a lot of us feel, because I see it in your face when I say it's offering time. You find yourself shifting to a space of being crestfallen, depressed, because I said it's time to give now unto the Lord. Dispirited when I announced that it's time to give back to God a dime out of every dollar. 
that God has blessed us with. It's during this aspect of worship where we're focused on giving that some of us find ourselves crestfallen for a variety of reasons, unable or unwilling to let go of the resources that have been requested of us. And as I consider this young man's demeanor and his disposition, from a sociological and psychological perspective in relation to Jesus' recommendation, I, I gained some insight into his decision to walk away as I considered the possibility, Jada, that he just might have been dealing with a disorder. Can, can I show you all my clinical take on the text? The text says that he was crestfallen. He was distressed. He was depressed and is holding on tight because he doesn't want to part with what he has affection for. According to the DSM-5, that's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, this sounds a whole lot like separation anxiety disorder. And when we consider the fact that a minority of our membership does the majority of the work, and a minority of our membership gives the majority of the money, it causes me to wonder, how many of us are holding on tight and can't let go because we're dealing with the same disorder? Separation, anxiety, it's a normal aspect of human development. It's chiefly experienced at a stage in an infant's development that helps them to understand the relationship and master their environment. And under normal conditions, this phases out around the age of two. But separation anxiety becomes problematic and shifts to separation anxiety disorder when the anxiety exceeds the developmental stage. Let me help you because you're looking confused. At two, it's acceptable for a child to feel crestfallen when what they've separated from and they have an affinity for it because their cognitive development hasn't progressed to the point where they can rationalize that though it's left me, that does not mean that it won't come back. What's problematic, Calvin, is when at age 30, that same person is still finding themselves crestfallen and depressed, unable to conceptualize the fact that just because it left doesn't mean it's lost. Come here, New Covenant. I get it. For a babe in Christ, trusting God can be scary and produce some anxiety. Th this faith thing can be new and different and scary, which is to be expected with a fresh faith. But to be a 10-year, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50-year saint and follower of Christ, and still struggle with the right response to God's request of our time, our talent, and our treasure, it's troubling and symptomatic of a disorder. Here's the reality of the matter, child of God. Can I help y'all to see something from a fresh perspective? Tithing really ain't about our money. It's about our hearts. And every time God blesses us with resources, God is literally connecting us up with the spiritual EKG machine. The sad reality is that some of us are constantly in full cardiac arrest. How long will we stay stuck? How long will we stay frustrated? How long will we stay facing financial failure all because we won't grasp the concept that an open hand is always better than a closed fist? Oh, I wish I had some people in here that have tried God and tested God and God has proven God's self to meet every one of your needs. We can't grasp this concept and so we keep our hands closed and hold on too tightly to stuff that we seemingly don't want to let go. At what point will we say enough is enough regarding how tightly we're holding on to our resources? I'm done, but did y'all notice when we read the text that this rich young ruler had faith in Christ 
concerning the eternal, but he struggled with Christ concerning the temporal. Y'all missed it. I said he had faith in Christ concerning the external and the eternal, but he struggled with Christ concerning the internal and the temporal. Y'all not getting it. Let me see if I can lay this hay where the horses can get to it. He was okay trusting Jesus with his soul, but he had difficulty trusting Jesus with his savings. And sometimes we don't recognize who and what our gods are until we're called upon to give them up. What is it that you're holding on to so tightly today that you seemingly can't bear to let go? And not letting go, it's hindering your progress. It's hindering promotion in your life. It's hindering your prosperity in various areas of your life or even access to eternal life. What is it that God is asking of that you keep saying before I let go? I need to hold on to it a little tighter. How might God be trying to stretch and increase your faith if you only let go? Your time, your talent, your treasure. What is it? Let me come this way. Who is it? That you're holding on to so tightly that God can't bless you because you booed up with the wrong person. God can't elevate you because you're surrounding yourself with the wrong circle. God can't move in your finances because you won't take the challenge that we put before you to at least create a budget and monitor your spending. What are you holding on to so tightly that you keep saying, I can't afford to let go? New Covenant. I would, I pray, I beseech you therefore, my brethren and sister, that you would make up in your mind today concerning whatever it is that you're holding on to, that enough huh, is enough. Thank you for viewing our worship service today. You can find us each Sunday morning at 9 o'clock a.m. right here in the sanctuary or on any of our streaming platforms. Facebook, YouTube, or our church website. You can also find us each Sunday morning at 11 o'clock a.m. on Chicago Cable Channel 25. Subscribe, share, gather your family and friends, and join our movement. If this ministry has impacted your life in any way, we ask that you partner with us financially by giving via the Giveify app or Cash app, by mailing your donation to Post Office Box 198217, Chicago, Illinois 60619, by giving on our website, www.thecovchicago.org, or by bringing your donation to the church office at 754 East 77th Street, right here in Chicago. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We are praying for you and we love you. See you next week. Be blessed.